Hey, thanks for meeting us at the Apple. I'm Vito Calisi. That's Jonathan Barron. And um, what a fun three games, John. The I think the Grimace era is still on. I think that's fair to say, right? The Grimace era is still on. We saw some uh, some Grimace drawings on some stomachs in the in the bleachers at Wrigley over the weekend. Um, what a it weekend seems like it was. the spirit of Grimace didn't like that, though, because that was the one bad game. So it feels like I, it, oh, it, almost Grimace's energy was did not like his face being portrayed that way. It was, um, but still, I mean, what a weekend for the Mets in Wrigley Field. Taking two out of three, a huge series. You know, you and I spoke earlier on Sunday night before the game started. I saw some chatter on Twitter about this saying that it might just be June 23rd, but this is a really big game for the Mets, for them to take the series, make it a four and two road trip, and really put a cap on a great weekend. And it was a great weekend, Vito. And I'm going to read off to you right now why it was such a great weekend for the Mets while they took two out of three against the Cubs, a team who was right there in the thick of things in this wild card race. They now hold the, the season tiebreaker against the Cubs, winning four of the seven games. Meanwhile, other teams in this race right now, the Diamondbacks, they lost two out of three to the Phillies. The Pirates, they lost two out of three to the Rays. The Reds, they lost two out of three to the Red Sox. The Giants, they got swept by the Cardinals. And the Padres, they took two out of three over the weekend from the Brewers, but they still lost on Sunday. So a lot of the teams that the Mets are fighting for right now had bad weekends, and the Mets had a good weekend going head-to-head -head against the team that they are competing with. So what a victory on Sunday Night Baseball. I mean, <laughs> look, that was chaotic. It started chaotically with, with Alvarez getting thrown out at third, and uh, we know how it ended. Uh, you know, I, I guess let's just mention it right now off the, off the jump. Of course, Edwin Diaz gets ejected from the game. Umpires say he had some sticky foreign substance on his hand. Um, so right now, the rule states that Edwin would be facing a 10-game suspension. We don't know what the plan is, whether the Mets appeal that or don't appeal that. All we know, obviously, right now at this point in time, right after the game, is that he was ejected. But we don't want that to put a cloud over the great weekend, the great offensive performances that were had by the Mets. They continue to slug. They've now had 16 home runs in their last eight games. And they take a huge two out of three from the Cubs. And they're now getting set to come back home to New York for what we know will be an exciting week with the Yankees coming to visit. And, you know, we said this the other night, but a few weeks ago when this game got flexed to Sunday Night Baseball, fans of both fan bases were confused and were like, seems like a crazy game to flex into this situation. Both teams are limping right now. Don't look too hot. And then, like, that game... The energy was insane. Now, Cubs fans are really loyal. They show up. They pack out the ballpark. So that definitely adds to the effect of it. But, like, I don't know. It's going to sound crazy to say about a Sunday night baseball June 23rd game. But there was, like, a playoff energy in the building as far as the TV broadcast. 100%. I mean, look, I think both teams realized what was at stake. And that was having that tiebreaker for the season series one way versus the other. So it was a, it was a massive win for the Mets. And like I just said, they're going to come home, play the Yankees. And then they're going to have the Astros at City Field, who are heating up after a really bad start to the year next weekend. And then the Mets are going to play nine straight games after that, three with the Nats, three with the Pirates, those both on the road. Then they come back home for the Nationals. It's going to be nine straight important games in this just insanely log-jammed race for the third wild card. And Vito, this was a, a third wild card spot that was invented or implemented, I'll say, a couple years ago, before the 2022 season. And we haven't seen anything like this quite yet, where you have literally seven, eight teams thinking that they have a stake to claim for a, a playoff spot and that they're going to be playing meaningful baseball into September. And you don't have many teams as it stands right now on June 23rd that are quote unquote sellers as we approach the trade deadline now five weeks away. This is crazy. And I do want to say that every week as we get closer to the deadline, there will be more series where teams that are fighting in this big jumble of, of, of teams fighting for this last spot, they'll be playing each other. So eventually the cream is going to rise to the crop, which is another reason why this to was such top. a big series for the Mets to the top. Sorry, um, but I'll hit you right now. Starting Monday, the Pirates and Reds open a series. The Nationals and Padres open a series. The Cubs and Giants open a series. So there's no there's no uh, overtime losses in baseball. There's no ties. One team's going to win and one team's going to lose. And that's why these head-to-head -head matchups are so important 
which makes what the Mets just did this weekend that much more important as they continue to solidify themselves, continue to play great baseball, 13 and six now in the month of June. Yeah, I mean, the whole point of the playoff expansion was to make the regular season more exciting, which is funny because you see a lot of fans saying that this delegitimizes the meaning of 162 game season. I think quite the opposite, because like you said, that deadline comes around. I don't think we're going to see as many people saying, let's just sell off and give up and pack up shop. When you're this close into it, you owe it to your fan base to go for it, right? So, I mean, right now, as it stands, so many teams in this race, and, like, it just gives you more exciting baseball to watch. Why wouldn't you want to watch more meaningful games? Why wouldn't you want that chance to just be able to watch games in September where every single game matters, every single inning, every single pitch? Um, But what a series for the Mets. Let's start off game one, Jose Quintana. I felt like we said in the London series, um, Jose can. Wait, when was it? We said Jose needed a big game. It was against the Padres, right? Padres, yeah. We said this. <clears throat> we said this leading up to the Padres series that Jose Quintana needed a really big game. He needed a good start. We didn't even say that this time, but man, did that feel good to see him go deep? And just looks so dominant out there. I mean, just got ground balls where he needed to. Got out of that jam in the first inning. And um, from there on, he just settled down and he looked just utterly spectacular. Also, first time I noticed, like, he's got such a strong presence on the mound, dude. Like, it's just like a very, it's like after every pitch, he just looks like a strong kid. Yeah, well, if there's one mound he's familiar with, it's that Wrigley Field mound. We told you in the last episode. He had made 42 career starts there at Wrigley Field, of course, former Cub, former White Sox, so very comfortable in the uh, city of Chicago. And like you said, he settled in, uh, you know, got into a bit of a jam there in the first inning. His defense let him down a little bit behind it, but then he got another double play ball. The Mets turned it behind him, traded the run for the two outs, got the third out of that inning, escaped it, still leading three to one. I mean, how about that start by the Mets, by the way? Lindor double, Nimmo reaches. Before you sit down and settle in for the ball game, it's 3 nothing Mets. J.D. Parks won straightaway center field. I mean, you know, the Mets, in a way, kind of had that game wrapped up uh, by 3 p.m. So that was a really nice nice way to get your weekend started <laughs> there. But, I mean, for Quintana, in that start, it seemed like he got stronger as the game went along. He had mm-hmm. a season high, eight strikeouts. He had 22 chases, which is a big number. He had 23 called strikes which is a big number, the most by any Mets pitcher in a start this year. So it wasn't just a, oh, steady Eddie, you know, limiting hard contact, pitching to contact, inducing a lot of ground balls. No, Jose Quintana had the Cubs just guessing all afternoon, and it was the opposite of what Mets hitters were doing against Shota and Minaga, who we saw just dominate the Mets back in May, early May. Back in that May start, Imanaga held the Mets to 0 for 9 with his split finger. On Friday... The Mets went 5-for-12 with his splitter, totally eliminated the pitch, made Imanaga throw the four-seamer a lot more, and the Mets just, you know know what, all over the four-seam fastball. They hit three homers. All of them came against the four-seamer. They were 4-for-5 against the four-seamer. Really the first team to figure out Imanaga. So another laugher, but boy, oh boy, what a performance by both Quintana, who now has had two two straight great outings, and the Mets offense, who just, I mean... (laughs) You know, for them to do that against the guy that's probably going to be in our rookie of the year, that's a really impressive performance by the Mets. Yeah, and that that game is so funny to look back on because um, after that first inning, it felt like it was going to be an edge-of-your-seat game. Like, it felt like you were going to be just on the edge of your seat, just like nail-biting. And then very quickly, it was just a snowball into an avalanche and just hitting is contagious, like we said last week, and the Mets just wouldn't stop hitting. I ran out to get a burrito across the street in the middle of one of those routes. Like, I just was like, oh, you know what? I'm going to run you out go? and get Where'd some you food. go? Where'd you go? Local I, place or Chipotle? No, I went to Twisted. It's a place across the street from me. What'd you get? What, what are you stopping got, that okay. bad boy with? Come on. All right. I got a burrito with r- white rice, black beans, steak, peppers, guac, um, pico de gallo. Uh, I, I think I said lettuce, sour cream, cheese. And dude, this place across the street from me, Twisted, they don't charge extra for guac or extra meat or anything. You kind of just, they kind of just like hand you everything and then charge you $10 at the end. Sounds like a bad business model. I'm not going to lie, but it sounds like it's a, a terrible business. Out. 
<laughs> you would love it, dude. You're being Mr. Quantity. You being Mr. Oh, Quantity, yeah. you got to come over to <laughs> Twisted across the street, dude. I love that place. But That's yeah, funny. I like the Mets. I think it was this. I can't remember if it was the second or third, but I literally was like, oh, you know what? Like, let me just run out right now. And I came back and they were still going. But yeah, game one was great. Game two. Um, look, it wasn't the best of games, but like, that's, that's, that's a baseball season. It's really hard. We said this last, we said this in the last episode, it's very hard to sweep a series. That's why most teams don't go 162 and oh, it's very hard to sweep a series, but, um, you know, it was a tough start for Tyler McGill. Um, he wasn't missing a lot of bats, but we've seen him bounce back from bad starts before. So we'll see what happens with him going forward. Yeah, I want to go shout out one more guy from Friday's one real quick. How about Jose Iglesias picking up four hits with two strikes, just shortening up, just almost throwing the bat at the ball and making contact. And I mean, he's just been a, a breath of fresh air. I know you heard, um, you saw the interview with Eduardo Perez and Francisco Alvarez on the Sunday night broadcast. And Eddie asked Francisco, Grimace or OMG, which has it been? And we all love Grimace. Don't get us wrong. But we also know that the OMG song has given this clubhouse life, as Pete yeah. said during his in-game interview. Um, it's been the victory song in the clubhouse after game, so it's been getting a lot of play. And we've been playing it at City Field after every home run. And it bangs also. Great song. Can't wait for it to drop on July 3rd. Should be earlier, Jose. Not going to lie. Um, but yeah, just shout out Jose Iglesias. Continues to get the job done. As for Saturday, there were two things I appreciated on Saturday. One I just mentioned. The guys in the bleachers with the grimaces on their uh, on their stomachs, which was hilarious. Number two was the moment where Francisco Alvarez hit a home run into the bleachers, and a guy wearing Mets gear caught the home run ball and was apparently peer pressured by those around him. The bleacher creatures, actually, they're not bleacher creatures at Wrigley. No, that's, that's Bronx. no, no, yeah, no that's Bronx. that's a different. That's a different. Yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, we'll talk about them in a little bit. Um. We will pressured by whatever the nickname for the Cubs bleacher sitters is to throw the ball back. Now, I know Steve Gelbs and Ron Darling addressed this on the broadcast. Steve said kind of spineless. Ron said not a leader. If anyone out there is listening to this interview or this podcast, sorry, on Monday at any point, maybe in the morning with your coffee on your commute, maybe while you're at work, while you're hammering away at some spreadsheets, want to get a little listen about what happened over the weekend with John and Vito meet at the apple, you know, the whole drill. And if anyone knows the gentleman who caught that ball and decided to give in to the peer pressure and actually throw it back instead of savoring a Francisco Alvarez home run ball, catching a ball at a baseball game is rare enough. Yeah. Catching a home run off the bat of a young stud, like Francisco Alvarez, even rarer, your chances, not high to throw that thing back. I would love to talk to the dude that actually gave in. I just want to talk. I just want to know what happened. Maybe someone said something really funny. Maybe he was on a date and the girl next to him was like, Hey, you got to throw it back. Come on. And he, I don't know what the reasoning was. What was the, I think it, behind that decision. I think it was just a bunch of boozy bats because you saw he was holding a boozy bat in his hand, which I didn't know the Cubs started selling. And, you know, I would love for more teams to do the boozy bats, but I think it could be maybe two to three boozy bats. And John on Friday's game, I was, when Ron Darling said, if you get a ball, if you catch a foul ball, do what that man did, hand it over to a kid. John, I'm 31 years old. I've never caught a foul ball. I'm going to make a promise to everybody on this damn podcast right now. If you see me catch a foul ball, and that's the first one I've ever caught, I'm not giving it to a kid. I will look all the children in the face as I catch my first foul ball, and I will say, one day you will catch one too, and it'll feel as good as I feel right now. So I will not be, if I catch a foul ball, I will not be giving it away. I can't blame you. I don't blame you at all. I think a lot of people will agree with that, especially if you catch it, catch it. I think yeah. that was an instance where like it was flipped to a kid. He dropped it. It fell on. Oh, the that's seat. different. If your guy picked any, it up when adults, when adults scream for balls from the ball boy, I, that, that kind of makes me, that makes me cringe. That gives me the ick. Like I'm not going to yell. I'm not going to yell for a 16 year old kid to throw me a ball. Like I'm 31 with health insurance. Like that feels crazy. Yeah, no, I hear you, but I, I get what you're saying about uh, wanting to keep that foul ball. Have but... you caught a foul ball or have you just got, have you like caught one off rip or have you just done like BP and you've caught two like in air? Two foul or balls. Like... Uh, one in, in air, air or off the ground? One in the air, one I knocked down with my chest. I, I happy Gilmore did. 
Um, let's see. Yeah, in uh, 2005, uh, my dad took me to see a pretty famous Mets Marlins game in September that was written about in the book. Uh, Pedro Martinez against Dontrell Willis, if you know, you know. Um, and Chris Woodward hit a foul ball, and I was a freshman in high school, I think. Yeah, I was a freshman in high school, and uh, I caught the ball. Um, and then in 09, I went to a game. I was dating someone at the time, dragged her to City Field. Um, Gary Sheffield hit this ball that I knocked down, fell, picked it up. I also had uh, Juan Lagares toss me the final out of an inning twice. I saw the Mets play the Reds when I was at IU because it was kind of close to Cincinnati. And I snuck down. I was right behind the Met dugout wearing my Robbie Alomar jersey. And uh, Juan Lagares saw me and flipped me not one but two. So, I mean, the game used... Like bat on ball, um, yeah, you know, running off the field, tossing it that counts, I think. So, I, I've no, gotten for my sure. fair share. I've gotten my fair share. The, the closest I got was Pedro Feliciano threw me a ball at Yankee Stadium in 09, and it was one of the branded uh last season at Shea Balls. Oh, really? That's awesome. That's really yeah. cool. So, I still have that, but back to back to this weekend. Um, yeah, I mean, look, like we said. Game two, not the most fun. Vibes weren't vibing as big, but that's just one game. Alvy went yard. That's always cool to see. There's always positives. Yeah. yeah, Francisco Alvarez. I mean, we'll talk a little bit more about him and what he did in game three, but I guess I'll just drop this right now. Since June 2nd, when Luis Torrens made his Mets debut, Mets catchers have combined for the highest OPS of any catching duo, trio, whatever it might be, in all the major leagues, and it's not even close. So, I mean, Alvarez, you know, we talked about it after the Padres series, said that this entire offense is clicking. He's still finding his groove. Just you wait. And then he has the huge hit in Texas, and he follows it up with another massive series here against the Cubs, the double on Sunday night, a couple homers, one on Friday, one on Saturday. I mean, he's just a beast. And you saw the way he handled in the ninth inning when Drew Smith comes in the game in the weird circumstance. He's just a field general. And for him to have that control at that young of an age at 22, it's special and it's crazy to think where this dude's going to wind up. The Mets are so, so lucky to have this guy on their side. I mean, what more can you say? No, there's not much more you could say, dude. Like, also the broadcast, I felt like that was the most I've seen ESPN hype up a young Mets player in a long time, like since Pete. And I would even say the way they were talking about Francisco Alvarez in that game was even different than the way they talked about Pete Alonso in his rookie of the year home run chase. Like they were just talking about him. Like uh, they were saying future star, this kid's going to be around a long time. There's so much superstar potential here. I'm not saying that that's not what they saw in Pete in 2019. I'm just saying the way they spoke about him was so special. And it's something that I think Mets fans have thought for a while. And you know, like, to just start talking about Sunday night's game, there was a few wait, wait, things in the one broadcast. More thing, one more thing about Saturday, real okay. quick. Talk about Mets catchers. How about the moment between uh, Francisco Lindor and Tomas Nito? Oh, when he started trying to slap the ball out of his head? Yeah, so if people don't know that those guys are buddies, which, like, best friends uh, uh, had been for a long time, if people don't know that, you're like, wait, what is happening? And that was the final out of the half inning. So they're going to commercial, and all of a sudden, you see the batter and the catcher getting into it, and they just go to break. So yeah, I got a couple texts like, wait, what just happened between Nito and Lindor? And I was oh, like, that, and you're at a game, you're best at friends, the game, you're a Cubs fan who has no idea. You don't really know Tomas Nito yet. You have no yeah. idea, like you said, you don't know that their relationship goes back to like high school, and that he's just sitting there trying to slap the ball out of his head. Because dude, <laughs> even me knowing that they're friends, when I saw the clip. Because at this point, I had ran out to do something. I just saw the clip a few seconds later, and I was like, wait, what's happening right now? And then I realized who it was. But no, dude, that was a that was a really fun moment. And, you know, when we saw that Tomas Nito was going to be part of this series, we were wondering in what way, you know, what that was going to be like. It's it's always sad to see a guy as homegrown and as loved as Tomas Nito, who was a really pivotal part of this team for a few years, to see them go. But I, I think that was, a, that was a perfect send-off. Now, John, can I talk about Sunday? Go for it. All right. Sunday, I just want to say uh, about the broadcast. Now, we're not going to bash any broadcasters. We understand everybody's doing their job. But, like, there were definitely some things in the broadcast that I I did not love. Um, and I thought there could have been a little more research done on their end. For example, they made it seem like Carlos Mendoza. They were like, oh, wow, look at this. He went out there, talked to Severino, and let him go back out. 
you never see that at all. Little do they know that's something we've seen throughout this entire year with Carlos Mendoza and different pitchers in the Mets on the Mets rotation. So that's just something I want to note because that's something we've talked to Mendy about. We've talked to Manaya about about how important that relationship is with Mendoza, about how the pitchers do have a great relationship for him and they have a feel with each other. Um, and then just some weird credit stuff where I felt like um, they were, I felt like the broadcast was taking away from how good the Mets were hitting and how on top of how on top of the pitcher they were. And they were kind of attributing it more to the umpire kind of like missing some calls. And I just felt like that was a little unfair to a team that was just on everything from the start. Yeah. I mean, I, I said this to you, I put this out there on Twitter first time through the Mets took 16 swings against Javier Assad. They did not miss one time. The first whiff was by Francisco Lindor in his second at bat of the game. In that at bat, he ended it by going opposite field into the bleachers. After that, Brandon Nimmo followed up by hitting almost an identical home run to the point where the exit velocities were virtually identical. And I think Nimmo's went one foot further than Lindor's. But, you know, you can't really draw back to back home runs being that identical like those two guys did. So the Mets were on Assad the first time through. They barreled up a lot of balls, which I know the broadcast did mention. JD's double, uh, Pete Alonso smoked one that Pete Crow Armstrong caught to end the first inning. But it was coming. The Mets were waiting to erupt. And right when they got those second hacks against the sod, they did just that. For Brandon Nimmo, he now has four home runs in his last six games. And Nimmo is now just two home runs shy of 100 for his career. So his power barrage continues. And he has been an absolute menace since Carlos Mendoza moved him to the second hole. We talked a lot about Mendy moving Francisco to uh, Francisco Lindor to the top of the lineup and the, the, the difference that's made. Now, Brandon Nimmo has gone from three in the lineup to two in the lineup, and that's changed a lot. And Brandon Nimmo has been a completely different hitter uh, with the surge he's gone on. So once again, Carlos Mendoza just continues to push the right buttons. It seems every single time he makes a decision. So, I mean, what more can you say about the job Mendy's done? Like you mentioned, leaving Sevy in to complete the inning. And I mean, I think this is a good time to talk about Luis Severino and his brilliance, his dominance on Sunday night. You agree with that? Dude, hundred percent. I mean, I texted you from the second Sevy stepped off the mound after the first inning. Sevy was just a man on a mission. And um, yeah, it was just, there's no other word, but dominant to talk about in that game. Season high, 10 strikeouts, first time since 2022, also against the Cubs when he was with the Yankees. And then John, I don't know if you heard on the broadcast, they mentioned this. He joins a pretty small group of pitchers to get 10 strikeouts for both the Yankees and the Mets. Well, that's a cool stat. I, I didn't hear that. I was listening. Uh, well, I wasn't listening to the broadcast for the last half of the game, but that's a really cool stat. I mean, Sevy, Sevy was on. I, I sent you this picture. I think you're going to splice it in here right now. His release points tonight. And why he was so effective. He was especially effective with this four-seam fastball and the sweeper. And when you can tunnel the pitch the way that Luis Severino was doing so, meaning having an identical release point and making it tougher on pitchers. And if you guys are watching right now and you can see my hands, if the four-seamer is coming from this release point and the sweeper is coming from out here, hitters are looking at the pitcher's hand. And that is an indication of what pitch is coming. So when pitchers can tunnel and repeat their delivery, and have identical deliveries regardless of the pitch type, then hitters have to guess, okay, is this going to be the four-seamer or is this going to be a breaking pitch? And it just so happens, of the 10 strikeouts on Sunday, five of them are with the four-seam fastball and five of them are with the sweeper. So Luis Severino, by being able to repeat his mechanics and have that same release point so consistently throughout the night with all the pitches that he threw, it made it impossible for Cubs hitters to figure out what was coming. Um and you really could tell the game plan. It was high four seamers against the lefties, and it was the sinker in against the righty, and it was the sweeper down and uh, down and away against the righties. And Severino just continued to beat the Cubs all night. I also sent you the picture of uh, his his pitch or his strikeouts and where they were located. Most of them were middle or higher. You kept seeing him beat Cubs up in the zone with that four seam fastball. He got great induced vertical break with that four seam fastball. Probably the best he's had all year. By far his strongest start as a Met. The first time he has had at least 10 strikeouts and no walks in a start since August of 2018. And I put this on Twitter. I'll say it here. The likes of Brett Gardner and Luke Voigt, who's now playing in the Mexican League, by the way, um, and Ronald Torres 
Friend of the show, Luke Voigt, by the way. Friend of the show, Luke Voigt. Although you guys never saw that interview, but I wish you did because it was probably the best one we ever did. Um, <laughs> Ronald Torres was also in the Yankee lineup that day. That, that's how long ago it was. That's the kind of vintage stuff that Luis Severino threw out there on Sunday Night Baseball under the bright lights. What a performance and what a pickup he's been by David Stearns and company in this front office. Wow, what a day. What a day. I mean, seriously, like, this was a you, massive you, win. Do you know that this makes the Mets 3-0 and in Sunday Night Baseball this year? The Mets are Sunday Night Baseball merchants, dude. Like, Lindor's three-homer game, Sunday Night Baseball. Sunday Night Baseball. Oh, last year, uh, the Guardians the Guardians game last year, Sunday Night Baseball, yep. the doubleheader. Game double header. Eduardo Escobar's yep. walk-off against the Phillies two years ago. Starling Marte's walk-off against the Yankees two years ago. Actually, 20, that wasn't Sunday 25. Night Baseball. That was an exclusive ESPN, not Sunday, not Sunday Night 2015, Baseball. 2015? 2015 Nats game that I've talked about. Yep. yep. So Sunday Night Baseball is just, that's our that's our time to shine. Sunday Night Baseball. You know what, Mets fans? I know sometimes you get angry that the game, the team gets flexed to Sunday Night Baseball. You want to have your Sunday Night routine. You want to hear GKR in the booth. But guess what? Sunday Night Baseball is our city, baby. A couple more things I want to touch on real quick. We touched on Seve. Uh, his great efficiency. He really kept the pitch count low in the first five innings, which was challenged in the sixth. Until the you jinxed third. it. Until I jinxed it. Then, uh, I mean, here are the pitch here are the pitch totals. Inning one, 14. Inning two, 10. Inning three, 14. Inning four, 17. Inning five, 15. My loud mouth puts that on Twitter. And then all of a sudden, Cody Bellinger rips off a 13-pitch plate appearance. Totally which, ruined everything. Which that plate appearance, dude, like, that is such... I hated that play. I hated that at bat so much, but it was so incredible. Like, as as a fan of the Mets, watching that was just like my heart was beating. It was so exciting, and the the fans at Wrigley, like, just kudos to them for like from I would say like the seventh or eighth pitch on, just standing up and going nuts for the rest of the sequence. Dude, that that at bat is like that's the beauty of baseball. That whole battle, the battle of pitcher. The battle of pitcher versus batter, man versus man, one on one, like that duel, like that was so thrilling. And as much as I hated it and I wanted it to end, it was just incredible every single second it went on. It was two ballers. It was best on best. And for it to last as long as it did, you know, Bellinger hung in there. Like I was sitting there thinking, okay, Severino is going to continue to try to pound the top of the strike zone like he's been doing all night with that four seamer. Bellinger was fouling it off. Okay, he's going to throw he, in the sweeper. No, Bellinger is fouling it off. He hit himself in the face in the middle of he that. Did. He did. It was it was really impressive. But once again, Seve gets the upper hand. He finally got that fastball by Bellinger. And once again, we saw some emotion from Seve. We've seen that at, at times throughout the season. Love to see it. All right. Two last things on the series that I want to mention. Number one, Jeff McNeil. I want to make a proclamation. Jeff McNeil is coming. In this game on, on Sunday night, he had four batted balls. Three of them were hard hit outs where he hit into some bad luck. Three of them had expected batting average of 360 or higher. One of them had an expected batting average of like 700, hit the ball about 105 miles per hour. Uh, he hit one into the corner on Saturday. You know how Wrigley kind of juts out there in right field. It was just the worst place to hit the ball. But Jeff McNeil has been putting good swings on balls. I really like what I'm seeing from Jeff McNeil. Forget what you see in the box score. He is really, it seems, turned the corner and found something at the plate. And he's going to play a lot coming up here because Tuesday, Wednesday, the Mets are going to see a couple of righties. We know that the Mets have been platooning a little bit, getting Iglesias in against the lefties and getting Jeff McNeil in against the righties. The Mets are going to see Garrett Cole and Luis Heel when the Yankees come to town. So Jeff McNeil, it's coming. And that's just going to be another hot bat in this Mets lineup. How about Harrison Bader, by the way? Two more doubles. I know you like to say that he's just constantly putting the ball over that third base bag. And look, he is. He's a dead pull hitter. You know, when he does his damage, that's, that's where he hits the ball. Dead pull hitter, but for you to get not one but two extra base hits out of that nine spot in the lineup, like that's that's murderer's row. It's tough. How is anyone competing with this? Yeah. What'd you think about the, the other, uh the what do you think about the Pete interview in the middle of the game? It was good. It was funny. That wasn't the last thing I was gonna mention. I had a good trivia question for all the fans, but I, I'm glad you brought that up because I know a lot of people on the internet like that that Pete interview. So may the odds forever be in your favor, or whatever they say in the Hunger Games. John, you're a big Hunger Games fan, right? I have, I have no idea what that is. You don't I know, know Game of you, Thrones. You don't know what the I don't. I'm not going to get sidetracked here, but you don't know what Hunger Games is. You've never heard of Hunger Games. I guess I've heard of it, but like I couldn't name a character. I couldn't. 
tell you that I have no clue. Any, I don't have a single detail about it. I'm not kidding. Not a bit. No, I, it's never a bit. I need I, I I need listeners of Meet at the Apple to understand that it is never a bit with John. This is 100% real. John doesn't watch movies or TV. He picks. He said he was going to be a movie guy this year. He's yet to really watch anything, so I don't really know what happened with that. Um, but I watch all a lot all, of Miss Rachel. The, I, I watch a lot of Miss Rachel. That doesn't count. Oh, you're, if Coco Melon and Miss Rachel don't count. Okay, I'm just saying. That's what I watch. That and the Mets. Uh, but the Mets have not lost a series since. Now, this is what I love about this season, John. Obviously, we're big Grimace guys. We're big on the Grimace era. But this is a season of many new things, like many new rally things, like we said last week. Because you have you have Grimace, the selfie. The selfie is another big one. The one, the picture they took after the sweep, after they got swept. Then you have um, Rally Pip, Max Max Weiner, who we had on the show. Um, then you have there's all these different moments this year. Then I'm even forgetting some right now. But like this season is just so incredible, so magical. June, the month of June, the Mets' worst month usually of the year is right now the month that is just rising them from the ashes of the bottom of the National League towards a playoff spot. And John. Do you know how many more wins? Do you know how many more wins we have than last year? I think they won what six games in June last year. Was it six or five? It was seven games last year. They won okay. seven games in June last year. Yep. Do you so know how many they've points. won this year? Thir- 13. 13 and six is the record in June. So one more win, and they will have doubled the amount of games they won this June versus last June. Now, obviously, last season has no effect on this season, but that just puts into perspective for you how just unique of a season this is. Dare I say magical? It's been a magical month. That That is for sure. Um, and look, we also said this on the last episode. Back in April, the Mets had a seven-game winning streak. They had it snapped in L.A. They never picked themselves back up. This time, they had the seven-game winning streak snapped in Texas in the series finale. They go to Chicago, and they win the series. So, look, I mean, baseball is a day at a time, right? Anything could happen. You never know. Yada, yada, and yada. And that's what they these- said. That is what the team said. If you remember what J.D. Martinez said after the team meeting, He said, we're not him and Lindor both said, we're not looking at this as like we want to win 101 games. We're looking at this as we just want to win inning by inning, game by game. Yeah. And I think that, you know, of course, the the circumstance in the National League with other teams also struggling and no one really running away with that third wild card was a big helper. But the Mets, as we said throughout all the struggles, were better than what the outcomes indicated because they were constantly taking leads into the late innings and they weren't going to continue to fail to hold on to those leads at the rate that they were. And they finally have started to secure the victories. And with that, a lot of wins have fallen into their possession. And now they are one game out of a playoff spot. That's it. One game. And the team that holds the third wildcard spot, by the way, they swept them last weekend. It's the Padres. And John, you keep saying that third wildcard spot, but I just want to also bring up they're only one more game back from that second wild card spot. So You're right. And, this is and I'll take it even further. I'll take it even further. The Braves are not out of further. their sight. I'll, the Braves are not out of their sight. With all the head-to-head games that they have left, and I'm not saying the Mets are going to sweep the Braves the rest of the way. Let's not get crazy. The Braves have been on fire. I think they've won eight of their last nine. But the opportunity is there for the Mets to at least breathe down the, the, the necks of the Braves with all the head-to-head meetings left. That's it. No, and that's fair. Like, uh, fans need to understand this. The NL is a wild place to be right now. The NL is the place to be. All three wild card spots are up for grabs. But like, I just don't want any fancy a down on oh for a third wild card fo- spot for a third wild card spot. No, it's for any of the wild card spots. Everything is in play right now. And if the team keeps playing like this, this isn't the except. This isn't the what is it? This isn't the rule. This is the you know what I mean. What am I trying to say? Yeah. This isn't the exception. This is the rule. Yeah, but that's, I felt like that sounded crazy, but that's definitely right. This isn't the exception. This is the rule. This is how the team was supposed to play. This is what we were told before the season. I'm fired up right now, and it's 11 o'clock, so I don't even know how I'm going to go to bed. I have to pick up my new car tomorrow. Oh, uh, wheels Khaleesi over here. All right, so uh, let's, let's just get into what's coming up here at City Field with the Yankees coming into town. Always a fun time. Look, a lot of people say like the Subway Series is outplayed and it's it's over and like we've done it too often. And get out of here with that crap. The Subway no. Series is so exciting. It's full ball full ballparks, no matter 
who's doing what, no matter who's in what place. When the Mets and Yankees get together, it's always a crazy time. And this is going to be an even crazier time because right now it ain't going so well. And I'm not saying that to be cocky. It's just not for the team from the Bronx. They just lost John Carlos Stanton. They lost Anthony Rizzo last week. Luis Heel had a tough outing his last time out. They just lost two or three from the Braves. They lost two or three from the Orioles before that. They lost the series to the Dodgers before that and the Red Sox before that. The Yankees are struggling a little bit. And we all know you've gotten this far in the podcast. Mets and their fans are feeling good and flying high. So it's going to be a very interesting couple days at City Field as these two teams renew acquaintances. You know what I would love to see fans do? What's that? I would love to see as much orange and purple as physically possible at the ballpark. I want to see tigers. (laughs) I want to see orange. (laughs) I want to see purple. If you're going to wear blue, make sure it's royal blue. Don't go too dark because then it could look like navy blue. But, like, show up and show out. Wear your Mets merch. Show up. Be ready to drown those guys out because you know they're annoying. You know how loud they are. You know how annoying they are. But this is our house. And keep it our house. Protect this house. Protect this house. I mean, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun. All the pomp and circumstance, but really just two big baseball games for a couple teams right now that are I don't want to say headed in different directions. The Yankees are gonna make the playoffs. We all know that. Uh, unfortunately for them, you know, they've got the record, what at 51 and 25, 26, whatever it might be. But the Orioles have been in lockstep with them, so it's gotten them in a dead heat essentially in the AL East, whereas the Mets struggles early in the year, like we just said. The rest of the National League was struggling, and the Mets didn't really fall too far out of it. Um, and the Yankees, having lost John Carlos Stanton on Saturday and putting him on the injured list on Sunday, it sounds like he's going to miss about a month, according to, St- according to Stanton himself. The Yankees just signed another former friend, that being <laughs> J.D. Davis, who was DFA'd by the Oakland Athletics pretty recently. And on Sunday night, it came out that the Yankee plan was to have J.D. Davis play first base mostly when the opposing team is throwing a left-handed starter. And it just so happens, Vito, that the Mets are throwing David Peterson and Sean Manaya at the Yankees this week, which means J.D. Davis is going to be in the middle of it all right after we saw Tomas Nito. And the Yankees also have both Phil Bickford in the bullpen and they have Michael Tonkin in the bullpen. So a lot of former friends on the other side that'll be uh, opposing and, forces and we, this week. And we have Carlos Mendoza and we have Luis Severino um and Jose Harrison Quintana Bader. who's and and Harrison, and Harrison Bader. Bader and Jose Quintana who started in the Yankees organization so everybody's gonna have to show up and just remember where they're supposed to be on that current day and not get confused by any any blurry New York signs or where they're supposed to walk but it's gonna be a really fun time subway series is always a blast and like right now they're gonna be even more imp- like even more high energy and in, in, uh fun because these games mean so much to us right now like we want the team to stay hot. We want this to keep, we want to finish June stronger than we ever have. So show up, support the team. Um, and uh, John, do you think it's time to talk about some minor leaguers before we get out of here? Yeah, I do. I mean, like you said, I mean, I just echo your sentiment of, of be loud. Uh, you know, don't, don't, don't let them, don't let them invade our space. Uh, this is going to be, a, that. that's why tonight was such a big win, by the way, to carry the momentum into Tuesday. I was really hoping, obviously I want to see the Mets win because it was a big game for all the reasons we laid out. But the Met fan base has been so energized, and it's so great to hear. You know, you listen to the radio, you go on Twitter, you go on the internet, you walk down the street. This is this is alive. It is alive. It is real. This team is making a push. No one expected this. And hey, here's the thing: we've seen this Mets team. Hey, two people expected this. Two people expected this. Two people expected this. That's why you listen to me at the Apple. We're a glass half full podcast, and it's not because we don't believe what we're saying. If we didn't believe it, we wouldn't actually say it. But How many times through our history as fans watching this team have we seen hot starts, good starts, good starts, good middle, bad end? No one needs that. That's bad. And it just so happens that oftentimes in baseball, teams do the opposite. We just haven't seen that yet. Well, we did in 2015. And had that wind up, by the way. Had that wind up. But 2015 Um, also started. 2015 had an amazing start, if you remember. It did, yeah. They they had 111 straight. And you bank those wins for sure. Um, but you know, they were kind of a middling team there for a while before. The oh no, happened. for sure. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, look, it's just, th- this team is different. You hear people saying it, there's something about this Mets team right now. I mean, I'll tell you what it is. You've got the stars hitting like the stars that they are. That's, that's really what it comes down to. 
and it's a really steady starting rotation and a bullpen that's been getting the job done all month. I mean, you put those three things together and you got a winning baseball team there. So keep it rolling. Huge series coming up. All right, let's talk about the prospects. Come on. So why don't we start off with Wilkin Ramos, who got promoted from double A AA to triple A, one and a third scoreless innings pitch during this week's span. And just exciting to see people move from the system, move throughout the system. That's what we say every week here. Yeah, in our last episode, I said, if you want to find a guy that could be the next Daniel Nunez, not really saying he is Daniel Nunez, but another guy that could come from the farm system and make an impact at the major league level out of the bullpen, look no further than possibly Wilkin Ramos. We did not know at the time. The Wilkin Ramos was about to get a promotion, and he finally did get the promotion shortly after we said that. And like you said, Vito, he made his AAA debut and had a good one. No runs in one and two-thirds innings and a really interesting delivery. Kind of throws it three quarters, really uses his whole body. A lot of a lot of movement there, really a lot of deception. So a uh, guy that throws hard as well. So a great, great uh, start to his AAA career for Wilkin Ramos, and we'll see uh, how that continues for the young right-hander. Yeah, and Ryland Thomas, four home runs and eight extra base hits in his nine last nine games. After just three all year, uh, Ryland Thomas is a guy that, you know, we've talked about on Future of Flushing a lot. If you do not subscribe to Future of Flushing, make sure to go listen. Uh, we'll be having a new interview this week and uh, hopefully a weekend recap for you tomorrow, depending on what time me and John get into work tomorrow, because this is a late night. It is a late night. Ryland Thomas is a really, really exciting young player. The defense is what stands out, and we've talked about it before here. We've talked about it on Future of Flushing, but that power bat now coming to the to the to the light, that's a really intriguing uh a situation with Rylan Thomas, who is a guy who will play in the major leagues one day. He will. That that glove alone will get him there. But the bat starting to get going, and he was pulling the balls. Pull side power. You love to see that from the left-handed hitter. He is a great bat to ball guy as well, serving pitches all over the place. Was that in college? Continue that when he became a pro. As he continues to grow and get through the ranks, remember he started the year in Double A, already a Triple A, so now just one stop away from the major leagues, and he is proving to be a legitimate, promising player. All right, let's talk about the Rumble Pony. Where Alex Ramirez had four hits, and he has twenty-five stolen bases, which leads the Eastern League. Yeah, those four hits on Saturday, really, really good sign for Alex Ramirez, who started the year gangbusters really cooled off in a big way. But the one thing about Alex Ramirez, even when he wasn't hitting, was he was continuously walking. There were games, he had a couple, four, I think he had four, or excuse me, one game with four walks. So he wasn't expanding, he wasn't pressing, he was reaching base the way that he could, and he was still making things happen, wreaking havoc when he reached base with 25 steals, like you said. So Ramirez, a guy that was a top 100 prospect not too long ago, had a rough 2023, has been a little bit up and down this year, but more good than bad. And even when he hasn't been going great at the plate, he's still been finding ways to make things happen. And the bat is finally coming back around right now. Love to see it for Alex Ramirez. And just to note, Bryce Montesteoka has began rehab. And, uh, you know, that is a guy that we thought last year was going to be a gigantic part of the bullpen. So it's always exciting to see one of those arms getting ready to come back. It is not entirely sure what the timetable looks like for Bryce Montesteoka. That rehab just started recently. But, hey, Sean Reed Foley, a thing that really, really wasn't talked about much uh, this weekend goes on the injured list. He had been a crucial part of the Met bullpen. So, mm -hmm. again, I'm not saying Bryce Montestioka is going to be off the uh, injured list or is done with his rehab and back in Queens this week or anything like that. But he's a guy who probably will factor in at some point. And late last year, by the way, or not that late, but July, when you and I were doing future of flushing on a nightly basis, a guy named Sean Reed Foley was making rehab appearances coming back from Tommy John surgery. And it just so turned out that he came back up to the major leagues, was throwing 97. And this year, like I just said, has been a huge part of the Met bullpen. So keep an eye on Bryce Montes de Oca. Don't forget about him. Had the Tommy John surgery early in 2023 before the season started. As we all know, a guy that throws absolute ched could play a role down the stretch here for the Mets. We're going to talk about Brooklyn now where Nick LaRusa, a guy we spoke to last season, uh, over on Future of Flushing. You can go listen to that episode on the Mets YouTube. Hit his 10th home run of the season on Saturday, and he was somebody who was drafted by the Mets in the 2023 draft, and like I said, we had a chance to talk to him when we went over to PSL in September. And a legitimate college bat. The Big Ten all-time RBI king, or single-season RBI, I should say, uh, did that for the University of Maryland, and that's carried over. You know, 10 home runs now, playing at high A. He's a... Uh, He's an interesting prospect. The stick is legit, and he's been doing that at Brooklyn, as we always talk about, a really hard place to hit. 
just yanking home runs over that Xavier High School sign that Vito loves so much in left field out there in Brooklyn. Um, I'm excited about Nick LaRusso. Uh, you know, some rumblings about some potential movement with some guys getting promoted on Sunday night. We'll see uh, what the Mets announce. But if that's the case, who knows what's in store for, for LaRusso, who doesn't really seem to have that much left to prove at high A, a little bit older than the league average age, but he's been really, really, really good with the stick at first base. And another intriguing bat in this Mets minor league system brought into the system, by the way, during the 2023 draft class, just a great return so far on all the guys taken by the Mets last year with the draft coming up, by the way, not too far away, Vito. And uh, we're going to finish off this little prospect report with uh, somebody that I want to give a special shout out to because um, I just, I, I cannot say enough positive things about Ronald Hernandez, uh, not just as a player, but as a human being. Ronald Hernandez is somebody that John and I spoke to on that very same PSL trip. And the player that we met uh, is just one of the most genuine human beings I think we had gotten the chance to speak to. Just what he had to say about his family, um, what drives him, his relationship with Marco Vargas, who he was traded over here with from the Marlins organization. Um, he's just a, he's just a really a really good kid, and I've been seeing his profile kind of rise a little on Twitter over the last few days. I've been seeing a lot more people talking about him. And it just made me really happy because uh, it, it was one of my favorite interviews we did just on a human level. And right now he's slashing 389, 421, and 556 in his last nine games. And there's a reason that we uh, traded David David Robertson for him. Yeah, athletic guy, can play first base, catcher as well. Uh, I mean, you can't have enough guys like that in the system. And like you said, just the sweetest guy in the world. When we saw him in spring training, came up to us, said what up. So we root for Ronald Fernandez both on the personal level but also – as Mets fans, because the Mets are really lucky to have a prospect like him. And of course, Marco Vargas and so many others in this system. I mean, this, this, this system has improved leaps and bounds across every level. There's talent. We say it all the time, but it's so true. And every week that passes by Blake Tidwell had a great start for the Syracuse Mets on Sunday. Every week passes by. There's another big performer. You know, we keep it over on future of flushing. We just kind of give you guys a little bit of a taste here. I mean, at the apple, but there are so many big, breakout stars up and down the system, wherever you look. It's just incredible. What were you going to say, Vito? Just one last note about Ronald Hernandez, something that I don't think we've ever brought up on this show. We talked about it on Future of Flushing a bunch. We talked to Ronald about this, but um, is also from Venezuela, like uh, Francisco Alvarez, and they've actually become friends and worked out together over the offseason. So those are those kind of relationships that you see at the major league level. The guys that get together in the offseason, those relationships that build over time, I mean, Ronald Hernandez might only be in low A, but you got to remember, he's not that much. He's not that much younger than Francisco Alvarez. Yeah, it's 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 crazy to think. I mean, that just also is another example, another bit of evidence as to how incredibly special uh, Francisco Alvarez is. So, wow, what a weekend! What a week for the Mets. Four and two on the road trip after a great home stand. They'll be coming back home, uh, and when they do come home, you guys can root on all the Mets, including Tyrone Taylor, who, by the way. Gave the Mets their first victory of the season. Feels like forever ago. It was a long time ago at this point, back on April 4th. He had the walk-off hit in Carlos Mendoza's first Major League win, that crazy victory, which was kind of uh, apropos for the way things were going to go this year. Mets were getting no hit, and all of a sudden, Pete Alonso hits the home run, and then two hitters later, the Mets have their first win of the season. But Tyrone Taylor has been a very, very under-the-radar great acquisition for the Mets. You saw him being used late in the game on Sunday for defense. He had a four-hit game not too long ago. And give, when given his chances, he has made an impact like everyone. We keep saying here on the show, 26-man roster, 1 through 26. And Tyrone has been in every part of that. A great acquisition by David Stearns, who obviously he is familiar with going back to his time with the Brewers, Vito. Yeah, so enjoy that interview with Tyrone Taylor. We're about to play. Uh, Tyrone is... Uh... Another guy who's just uh, been really cool to John and I, uh, always down to just stop and say what's up, have a quick conversation. Uh, me and him will have a conversation in this. Uh, we I bring up a lot on the show that I help with the smoke that the players run out to. If you're not familiar with what that is, because I don't know if I mentioned this in the interview, it is the smoke machines that you see come up. So when we say we're doing smoke together, it is fog machines. It's nothing more, nothing less. But enjoy that interview. We're going to dip out now. We would love to see you on the other side, but it's getting late. The boys got to edit and get up early to go to work tomorrow and get ready for the Subway Series. 
You can follow me on Twitter at Vito F. Khaleesi, John on Twitter at JMB9191. Make sure to like, subscribe, go give us that five-star rating. It really helps. Uh, go subscribe on Apple and Spotify and enjoy the interview with Tyrone Taylor. See you next week. Hey, what's up? It's Vito Khaleesi, Jonathan Barron. We're meeting at the Apple, this time with Tyrone Taylor. Uh, we haven't gotten a chance to sit down and talk to you since spring training. But, I mean, I do. I feel like I talk to you a little bit sometimes when we're in the dugout before the game, and you even you helped me do smoke recently. Yeah, that was awesome. It's a good it's a good uh, tempo setter to start the game, for sure. Now, uh, the reason I asked you to do it was I saw you were looking at Manaya when he was doing it, and it looked like you wanted some of that action. Yeah, I was a little jealous, and uh, I'm glad I got the opportunity, for sure. Thanks for that. You want to do it again? Of course. Nice. Okay. So next time. Wait, wait. Did we win? I think you guys are. I think it was three and one was the record. Three and one with the players doing smoke. You and Sean did it together, right? No, no, no. No, No, they don't. Uh, They did it separately. You can't do it together. I mean, just don't tell me if I was a loss and I'll do it again. I don't think you were. I don't think you were. I'm I'm, I'm being honest here. I don't think you were. Yeah, we could do it again. Nice. All right. Well, things are going well for you right now. Your first career or second career, excuse me, four hit game on Wednesday against Miami. What's been going on with you with the plate? How are you feeling? Um, I feel pretty good. You know, uh, Baseball, you just, I feel like I just try to get better every day. Um, there's always something to work on, constantly making adjustments, and to be able to have some success like that and contribute for the team, it, it feels good. So last time we spoke to you was before you lived in New York for a while, and uh, I remember you said like your only experience was just walking around before you moved here and eating hot dogs off carts. What's it like living in New York? It's awesome, man. I love it here so much. It, I'm, I feel like a local New Yorker now. I have my own little breakfast spot that I go to a lot. Um there's a lot of good other food options around me. I'm just I'm just walking around, cruising around, and then headed to the ballpark to work. And I love it out here, man. What's an off day like for you? Um, a lot of a lot of food, and then video games or Netflix. What are you playing on the sticks? Call of Duty. Only or, Call of Duty. You're sports. Or, you're a sports game guy at all, or no? Yeah, this is this is gonna sound funny, but I <laughs> I played. In spring training, we didn't have any. We didn't have very good Wi-Fi at the hotel that I was staying at. Shocker. Oh no. <laughs> it's that PSO <laughs> Wi-Fi, man. It'll get you. So I played. I played about. I'm on year, and Madden 2023. I'm about year 2030 of a, of a season. What position are you playing? Um, no, I just drafted my own team. Like I'm. Oh, you didn't do like a not road to the show, but whatever the feature is in Madden. Yeah. Where you no, have Madden's your own franchi- Madden's big I got, franchise. I got guys on my team that are like completely made up now. There's like there's no guys that anybody knows. Like the Kyler Murray. What or team Aaron are you Rogers. using? I use the Cardinals. Okay. I feel like Madden's fallen off, dude. Like, I haven't bought a Madden in a long time. You know, like, Madden back in the day, Madden 10, 11, that was kind of the end of it. It was really good in, like, 05, 06. Well, no, 05, it was actually not even Madden. Wasn't the, it was ESPN 2K5. No, no, Madden was always No, good. ESPN 2K5. No, I know, yeah. the helmet view. I yeah. know. I know not just the helmet about. view, but, like, the road. The <laughs> no, Madden was always better. ESPN you guys stopped K5. after Mike Vick left or what? No, so Vick was 04. That was the QB Vision game. He ran all over the place. Yes, yeah. it, it was awesome. a cheat to use him. But also, like, LT <laughs> was a cheat. And then the year Sean Alexander was on the cover, that was a cheat. Madden was, dude, you were playing 2K. ESPN, only ESPN 2K5 is looked at as like the the best story mode for a game for a football, a football game. game? It yeah. was a football game, so yeah. They used to have like, the rights. You used to in that game when you play when you played as like your creative player, you had to take like IQ tests. You had to like answer press conference Whoa. questions. They like, had the wonder like in Madden also. No, but in this one it's so much better. You had to like you would get like movie option like that. You would get you would get a movie role and then you would have to remember your lines and then like you would play a, a multiple choice quiz where you had to like guess remember what your lines were from the script you Dang. read a few minutes before. That actually helps your mind probably. It was like Mario yeah. Party. Mario Party's like it's that too. Nothing like that doesn't sound anything like. <laughs> No, Mario, Mario Party has like which which of the uh, which of the fruits that you just see appear on the screen. It absolutely does. Look it up. Uh, let's get back on track. Here. Wait, so let's talk. You know what I want to talk to? I want to talk about, about London. I want to talk about London. Where you want to talk about? Well, I want to talk to him about. It. I saw this guy run out of the dugout okay. to go say hi to Vinny and Mike from Jersey Shore. Yeah, that was epic, man. That was like I don't know. I just remember crushing all those episodes of Jersey Shore when I was younger. So when I saw them in person, I was like, holy crap, that's. That's Mike from Drew Shore, and he's jacked. Would you yeah. say? Go, Vinny, Vinny says he's back on the. You know. I was, I was, I was so jealous that I didn't get asked to catch the first pitch. And DJ, when I asked him, he was like just rubbing it in my face, and I was like, "Dang, bro, that's just messed up." But I, I ran over to give him a handshake because I just thought it was so cool. I literally, I saw the two. I think Chloe and Gabby were with them, and they said that they didn't know you were running over, and they just like popped down. They saw you like come through. Oh yeah, it was, I'm already an awkward person, so for me to do something like that is like super uncomfortable for me. But I'm glad I did it, and it was super awkward also. But it was all good. How would you rank which <laughs> of the boys were most excited about those two being here? Um, I know Tyler I McGill do, was every, pumped. Yeah, McGill was pumped. I feel like everybody was. That was the most people I ever seen out there from our. 
from our team for a first pitch. And then that's what I was going to say. It looked I, like it was the biggest reception the players pumped. had ever. I saw <laughs> I saw multiple guys jump over the 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 dugout <laughs> no fence. No way. I saw, for, I saw a few. Well, like a walk off win. I'm not going to name names, <laughs> but I saw multiple dudes jump over the fence to go greet while, them and while say what's they, up while they were throwing. Or no, before when they uh, were just because they walked over to say hi to all the guys, which also doesn't happen. Like usually they don't bring the first pitch person over to say hi to the entire yeah, that's team. That's awesome. They did it right for sure. Yeah. How about London? How uh, how much fun was the trip for you it was a lot of fun um i've never i've only been out of the country once to go to toronto for uh, that's north america for, for playing but yeah it was, it was nice did a couple team things and then got to venture out on the off day it was cool what did you do on the off day um we had a team dinner that night and then afterwards we were able to go on this uber boat which i thought was epic and we saw like london bridge right in front of us lit up it was awesome how about Sunday's game? What a what a win for you guys! Oh yeah, that was huge. That how it ended was epic. Man. First time so, it's ever happened, you know, two three double play like that to end a game, ever in ever, Mets history or baseball history. No way! Yeah, a game ending two three in double London. Play. That's pretty cool. For I know, this. right? That's got to bring fans to the game for sure. Out there, like, there's got to be more fans. How was it playing on the turf? Because obviously, watching on the broadcast, we saw how much the ball was bouncing. Yeah, and it was a like, trampoline, bro. What did you feel it when you were walking? Um. Not so much when I was walking, just as soon as, like, usually when I get out to turf fields, I test out, like, the outfield and stuff, so I like to bounce the ball, and then as soon as I bounce the ball and it almost bounced up and hit me in the face, I was like, oh, man, we got we got a lot going on here, but the whole experience overall was awesome, man. I, uh, I'm thankful for it, and I'm thankful I got to share it with my family, too. My girl was out there, so we, we enjoyed it. Um, yeah, it was a good time. Well, dude, thanks so much for joining us. Uh We'll uh, we'll get some smoke together soon. I'll throw that into the episode, and uh, we can, people can see the good work you do before the game as well as during the game. Get the boys Heck hype. Yeah. Heck yeah, man. yeah. Do, wait, real awesome. quick, isn't it it's crazy? Gotta be, it's got to be top top five entrance to the game for sure. We need some flame, Nobody, don't we? Yeah. We need some fire. The opening day like fire. The opening day fire. Did you like that? Yeah, that was tight. Yeah, I we like got to bring that back. No, every every day though, that would be. <laughs> <laughs> It's a lot of ISO, <laughs> ISO propol, whatever the, uh, the, the the fluid is. There might, that might heighten the chances of someone getting injured. No, like we keep it safe. So we keep it safe. It's tested. Safety it's good. First. FDNY There's is always here whenever we use a flame. Starfire? Star. Starfire. Star Shout fire. out Starfire. <laughs> um, but the the funny thing about you guys doing smoke, when I'm down there doing smoke, just I'm just in the corner. I hide. When yeah, you I were showing that you were the one controlling it. You just yeah. thought I was standing down there just yeah. for no reason, uh, which is funny. I think it was Sean was the first person to see me like holding the thing. But would you say, do you notice that when you and Sean do it, how fired up everybody gets for you guys? To do oh, the yeah. smoke? I remember the first day Sean did it because Sean, Sean made it known like he was bragging about it. And so, so we were all jacked up for him to do it. And uh, we kept trying to tempt him to do it early and stuff. But Brandon said to him, no, it's not time yet. Don't do it. And then he did end up was, testing it. Was, it. Somebody was faking going on the field. Lindor does that all the time. That's that's his oh, thing. Lindor yeah. got him. Uh, Lindor yeah. got him on the yeah. he, he 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 tricked him. He actually cheated a little, though, because usually he'll just do a little juke. He actually fully ran yeah, up the stairs. he went up a couple stairs. Yeah. Yeah. This should be a pass the baton thing. You know, teams have, like, a, a belt. It should be, I nominate you. So Or, think or about that. whoever does it that day and we get a win should just keep it rolling. King of the hill. Yeah, I like right. that too. Cool. So, well, Tyrone, thanks so much for joining us. You can listen to Meet at the Apple on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. We're available on the Mets YouTube as well. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.